Hey everyone, have you ever wondered what hell is? Have you ever wondered what kind of pain lies there? Have you ever asked, why would God torture people? Well, that's exactly what we're looking at in this week's episode. But before we begin, let me give you the quote of the week. And this week's quote comes from Peter Drucker and he says, Knowledge has to be improved, challenged and increased constantly or it vanishes. I'm your host, Jaden Gomez, and you're listening to Bible Basics and Beyond. I am so excited to get into this week's topic, which is hell. It has been highly requested and I have had so much fun preparing for this episode. So we'll be looking at this topic of hell in three main points and with it answering some questions about hell. So number one, the definition of hell and its names. Number two, what is hell like? And number three, the truth of hell, where we will explore how can a good God send people to hell. So I hope you're ready for an interesting episode. So let's just get started. All right, point number one, the definition of hell and its names. Now let's look at two definitions, one that is like universal and one that's found in the Bible. So let's start with the universal. In religion and folklore, hell is a location in the afterlife in which evil souls are subjected to punitive suffering, most often through torture as eternal punishment after death. Religions with a linear divine history often depict hell as an eternal destination, the biggest examples of which are Christianity and Islam. Now, in the Bible, hell is defined as a place of total, conscious, and eternal separation from the blessings of God. Now, if a person rejects God all throughout their life, never acknowledging or submitting to Him in repentance, then that person will enter eternity after death without God. Now you can see that these definitions are significantly different. One based on what the world sees, so that universal um, eye, and one based on God. Now let's get to the names of hell. So in the Bible, hell has many names, and these names describe or refer to hell. And we're going to look at three of them, Gehana, Sheol, and Hades. So let's look at Gehana. In the New Testament, the word Hell is translated from the Greek word Gehana, which is the Hebrew for the Valley of Hinnom. Now, this was a place southwest of Jerusalem, where years before the Jews inhabited Israel, pagans in the land would worship Molech by sacrificing children. Now, to read more about this time, you can check out Leviticus 18 and Leviticus chapter 20, and as well as Deuteronomy chapter 12. Now, according to David Guzik, This was a place outside Jerusalem's walls, desecrated by Moloch worship and human sacrifice, thus turned into the dump where rubbish and refuse were burned. Now the smoldering fires and festering worms made it a graphic and effective picture of the fate of the damned. Now let's get to the second name, which is Sheol. Now in the Old Testament, the King James Version translates hell as Sheol. Now, this means the underworld, or place to which people descend at death. Now, in the New Testament, this word is also translated as Hades in the Greek, which also refers to the place of the dead. Now, let's look at that word, Hades. In Luke 16, verses 23 to 24, it describes Hades, where he was in torment. He called, I am in agony in this flame. Now, in this passage, we find the term Hades, which is the invisible world of the dead. The New Testament use of Hades builds on its Hebrew parallel, Sheol, which we just looked at, and which was the preferred translation in the Greek Bible, which is the the Septuagint. It's a very hard word to pronounce. And you can see that just looking at these three uh, words that describe hell and also refer to hell, Hell has many names, but each one describing a place of death. Each one different, but describing hell. All right, let's get to point number two, which is what is hell? 
Now, hell is described in the Bible with images of darkness, gnashing of teeth, fire, and complete separation from God. Now, we're going to look at those first three, darkness, gnashing of teeth, and fire. So let's first look at darkness. From the oldest book of the Bible, which is Job, to the last book, Revelation, darkness is constantly associated with hell. It's a recurring theme. Job writes of a land of deepest night, of utter darkness and disorder. He also writes of a realm of darkness, even a day of darkness. And other references throughout the Bible include thrown outside into the darkness, blackest darkness, plunged into darkness. So through these things, we see that darkness is almost consistently associated with hell. And now let's look at number two, which is gnashing of teeth. Now that sounds pretty scary, and because it is. Jesus, who spoke about hell more than anyone in the Bible, used this phrase to describe the intense suffering in hell. Now, gnashing means a binding or a grinding. And here's where Jesus warned people about the place where there will be gnashing of teeth. Now, this is the theme of suffering and pain. And that's why it is scary and painful. And you can find like these gnashing of teeth and Jesus speaking about this in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke. So mainly in the New Testament. Now, let's look at fire. Isaiah in the Old Testament prophesied about hell as the place where the fire that burns them will not be quenched. That is found in Isaiah 66 verse 24. Now this unquenchable fire is also referenced in the book of Mark and many other times throughout the Bible and they describe it as a blazing furnace, the fire of hell, an eternal fire and also tormented with fire and brimstone in Revelations 14, verse 10. So now you can see these three themes, darkness, gnashing of teeth, and fire, are consistently associated with hell. Now we're going to move on to the final point, point, which is point number three, the truth of hell. Now, the truth of hell is that it is complete and total separation from God. Now, God is the author of life, light, love, peace, and blessings. Now, even though it is frequently described as as an eternal punishment, it must be viewed more as an absence of God's blessing than as an act or commission. Both the redeemed and the unrepentant experience God's gifts on earth frequently without realizing it. We see this in verses like Matthew 5 verse 45, which reads, that you may be sons of your father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. However, hell is an unending absence of God's love, presence, and other blessings. Now, here are some verses from the Bible that explain that explain that hell is indeed an eternal separation from God. Let's first look at 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, which reads, Shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Matthew 25 verse 46 says, Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. You see, after all this, you may be wondering, how can a good God torture people in hell? And send them to hell. Now this is a big question. And that's usually um, how people say that God isn't real. But the answer to this question is. He is doing neither. To understand this. You must understand the nature of God. You see the true and main nature of God. Is love. Remember John. 1 John 4 verses 7 to 8. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his own one and only son into the world that we might live through 
him. Now look at first John 4 verse 16. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. And one more verse to show the the main nature of God, John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So you see in the Bible, there are so many verses that tell us the true and main nature of God, which is love. God loves everyone. His nature is love. He sent his son to die for everyone because he loved us. You know, and you can find so many verses in the Bible, even dating back to Jeremiah 31 verse 3, which is long ago, the Lord said to Israel, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love, with unfailing love. I have drawn you to my self. See the main nature of God, which is love. But, now there's a but, although God is love, he is also just. God's love ensures justice. Without justice, love cannot survive. Understand that. God's nature is both perfect justice and perfect love. Both of these are equally powerful. Now, God is totally fair. He has no axe to grind. He is not out to get you. He is the most competent, intelligent, impartial, and fairest judge you will ever have. No one will get a bum decision at God's uh, judgment seat. Every human being can be guaranteed absolute justice. Justice means be fair with everyone and treating everyone equally. Now, we thus find ourselves under the law of divine, divine justice. You reap what you sow. The Bible says in Galatians 6 verses 7 to 8, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please God's spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. You see this law of this divine justice. The prophet Ezekiel declared in Ezekiel 18 verse 4, the soul that sins shall die. And the apostle Paul echoes, the wages of sin is death in Romans 6 verse 23. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. This is justice in its purest form. You grow something, you get something back. If you grow an apple tree, what are you going to get? You're going to get apples. You're not going to get mango. You're not going to get um, jackfruit. You're going to get apples. So if you sow evil, you will get evil back in return. Therefore, we must cast ourselves on God's mercy. You know, even though we are guilty and deserve to die, God still loves us. Sometimes people get the idea that God is a sort of cosmic tyrant up there, out to get us. But this isn't the Christian understanding of God. Listen to what the Bible says. This is found in the book of Ezekiel. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, says the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord. So turn and live. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die? Here, you can see that God literally pleads with people to turn back from their self-destructive destructive course of action and be saved. He wants them to be saved in this in this passage that we've just read, he doesn't want the wicked to die. He wants them to turn from their ways. He wants them to turn and live truthfully in, in the way of righteousness. You know? And in the New Testament, it says, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all 
should reach repentance. That is in 2 Peter 3 verse 9. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, it's reinforced. He desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now thus God finds himself in a kind of a dilemma. On the one hand are his justice and holiness, which demands punishment for sin, rightly deserved. But on the other hand are God's love and mercy, which demand reconciliation and forgiveness. Now both are essential. Neither can be compromised. What is God to do in this dilemma? The answer is Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment of God's justice and God's love. They meet at the cross, the love and the wrath of God. At the cross, we see God's love for the people and his wrath upon sin. On the one hand, we see God's love. You know, Jesus died in our place. He voluntarily took upon himself the death penalty of sin that we deserve. The Bible says, in this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now that is found in 1 John 4 verse 10. <clears throat> so back to hell. Hell is a consequence, is the consequences of one's act of sowing and reaping the consequences of one's own evil actions and not choosing to follow the ways of God. Not so much God wanting to punish or torture someone else. Hell is the culmination of man's sin and nature and evil. You see, hell, if we look back to the episode I did last week on Lucifer, hell was never meant for human beings. When Lucifer rebelled against God, um, God didn't want Lucifer and his fallen angels in heaven. Neither did he want them on earth. So God had to create a separate place just to hold them. And that place was absent, didn't have God's presence there. Therefore, what reaped there was death. Because as we've seen in this episode, God is life. God is light. God is love. God is mercy. God is peace and God is blessing. So hell is the absence of God. And the absence of God, because God is life, is death. So hell is a place of death. And you see, God is not torturing people. And as we just, uh, looked at last week, Lucifer isn't torturing anyone in hell because Lucifer himself is going to be tortured. Oh, you know? So really, you are being tortured, like people who go to hell are being tortured by their own evil because in the world of the living in, uh, on earth, they chose to sow evil. They chose to make the wrong decisions. They chose to reject God and his love and his forgiveness and his mercy and continued in their way of sin and continued in their way of evil and wickedness. And therefore, when they go to hell where it's an absence of God's life, God's, um, God's presence and his life and his light, it's just death. And what reaps is what they sowed on earth, evil, wickedness, and all the wrong decisions they make. So you see, you're not being tortured by someone. You're being tortured by your own decision. Like I was saying, hell is the culmination of man's sin, of man's sin, nature, and evil. You see, the wrong choice man makes, the abuse of power, that is what is going to be reaped in hell. The, the death. It is not a punishment from God but a consequence of your own doing, a harvest of what you reaped on, a, a harvest on what you sowed on earth. Thank you for tuning in this week. Unfortunately, time has run out. I hope you enjoyed this episode as, as much as I enjoyed preparing it for you all. And I would appreciate if you guys really let me know what sort of questions you want to hear explored, what things um, you want to um, want me to study and share with you guys um, because that helps me create and explore what you guys want heard. So don't forget to comment, like, subscribe and hit that notification bell for, no for more thought-provoking episodes. And I hope you learned something and were blessed 
by today's episode. And don't forget to join us next week as we continue to explore Christianity, the Bible, God, and whatever lies beyond. Have an amazing week. And remember, God loves you.